M S W Media. Welcome to Teacher Quit Talk. I'm Miss Redacted. And I'm Mrs. Frazzled. Every week we explore the teacher exodus to find out what, if anything, could get these educators back in the classroom. We've all had our moments where we thought, what the hell am I doing here? From burnout to bureaucracy to soul-sucking stressors and creative dead ends. From recognizing when it was time to go to navigating feelings of guilt and regret afterwards, we're here to cut out the gaslighting and get real about what it means to leave teaching. We've got insights from former teachers from all over the country who have seen it all. So get ready to be disturbed. Join us on Teacher Quit talk to laugh through the pain of the U.S. education system. We'll see you there. The rule of law is not just some lawyer's turn of phrase. It is the very foundation of our democracy. The essence of the rule of law is that like cases are treated alike. That there not be one rule for Democrats and another for Republicans, one rule for the powerful, another for the powerless, one rule for the rich and another for the poor, or different rules depending upon one's race or ethnicity. To serve as Attorney General at this critical time is a calling I am honored and eager to answer. So yeah, now it's clean up on aisle 45 time. And for a long while yet, it is going to be clean up on aisle 45. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode, episode 14 of Clean Up on Aisle 45. I can hear <laughs> my colleague, Andrew Torres, sighing in the background. Uh, this is AG. Everyone, hello. Andrew, how are you? I, I didn't realize I was sighing. I was uh, <laughs> pleased, as always, to be doing the show with you. This is our, our Earth Day episode, so I am uh, very excited about that. Yeah, I figured the reason that you were sighing was because we all sort of had to sit and watch those closing arguments by the defense uh, today and then the following many motions uh, to uh, for a mistrial that they made, which I am assuming is sort of the normal order of things, that the, the defense is always going to ask for a mistrial for various reasons at the end of the trial. Um, I don't know that the defense always asks for a mistrial. I mean, it's sort of worth it. It, it Certainly, that comes up a lot. Um, if I would say if you were very, very comfortable uh, in thinking that, you know, you'd put on an awfully good case in this trial, yet you probably wouldn't be angling for a mistrial. Um, it's worth explaining, right? A, a mistrial is literally, you know, the Simpsons bad court thingy. And what happens is it's like the first trial never happened and you get a do over, right? There's no it, it, d- double jeopardy doesn't attach. Uh, it's not like it is an acquittal. You get no affirmative rights out of it. It's generally thought to help the defense because you've got to put the case on a second time. Um, sometimes uh, witnesses that did a good job for you the first time around do a less good job the second time around. Sometimes witnesses are unavailable. Um, and generally, you know, if uh, if if there are circumstances that lead to a mistrial that, you know, that can be um, uh, that can cause a prosecutor to sort of rethink the case. Uh, but in any event, please, please continue. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I mean, let's look at my. I, I took a few notes here mm. on these uh, finishing things uh, <laughs> because th- it struck me as weird. Now, uh, uh, some of the things that the defense brought up was that uh, there was a 98% blood ox level. So he couldn't have been asphyxiated. But then he went on to say, but they pumped oxygen into his body at the hospital. And I'm like, well, then that would account for the <laughs> 98% blood <laughs> oxygen, wouldn't it? <laughs> like, would you just discount your own remarks it was it, weird it there was a lot that felt disconnected in the defense closing arguments because remember that 98 percent uh also contradicts their alt cause of uh you know george floyd asphyxiated from uh inhaling carbon monoxide right um and there was a dispute by and among the experts on that it it, it i mean nothing i saw today 
changed what you and I have been saying for two weeks here, which is the prosecution seems exceptionally competent and focused. This is how you bring this kind of case. This is how you prove it before a jury. And uh, the defense has lacked uh, a, a, a coherent and cohesive theory of the case as to why we're here. Right. Um, and and we have mentioned that by comparison to, you know, other cases that um, have have had strong evidence against a, uh, a particular criminal defendant. But, um, uh, you know, where, where juries have uh, have come back not guilty. Um, seems like that's going to be tough to do in this case. Mm. And I, I I hope I'm not being overly optimistic on that. Obviously. I don't think so. I, I Josh Campbell was in the courtroom, uh, you know, a reporter for CNN, former FBI guy, and he was he was giving some color commentary on what was going on with the jury while the defense was presenting their closing arguments. That's that's Chauvin's lawyers. Yep. And Josh Campbell said that the, the jury looked annoyed with what with what the defense was saying. We can't see the jury on the camera on the t- in the TV camera. So uh but he did he did mention that uh, especially when the defense started talking about chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> Uh, in a murder trial, and and the 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 reason they brought up chocolate chip cookies. And by the way, if you were a grown adult fucking person, and you're sitting there in the jury, and the lawyer is like, "Well, let's take for example chocolate chip cookies. Chocolate chip cookies have a recipe. There are ingredients to chocolate chip cookies. If you leave out one of those ingredients, you no longer have chocolate chip cookies. This is like the law." The laws have elements. All of the elements of the law have to be... And the jury's like, yeah, you fucking dildo. I just watched the prosecution cross off every single element of each particular law that we have to consider. Like, I would be very annoyed with that sort of... It just felt very patronizing. Yeah, I I agree with you. I mean, it. it, it I should add... It's a fair criticism of my trial strategy uh, that I often um, talk over the jury. (laughs) Uh, So, uh, you know, guilty is charged on that one. But that that felt uh, it it felt patronizing to me, too. And it felt like the kind of thing you do again when you don't have a cohesive story that you want to tell and 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 contrast that with what the prosecution got up and said right the prosecution got up and brought back their opening statement and said look um you've had two weeks of 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 trial testimony and it turns out you can believe your eyes you watched the murder of george floyd you know that that went on for nine and a half minutes. You know it wasn't necessary. You saw it on the screen. And nothing that came up over this past two weeks should lead you to think, oh, there's some secret law trick or this or that that makes you feel any differently. And and that's a really, that's a damn good argument. Yeah, and, and the defense, I think, deep down in their hearts, agree with you. Because they their opening statements to their closing argument... <laughs> Uh, was to define what reasonable doubt is. They didn't come out and say Derek Chauvin is innocent. They came out and started defining reasonable doubt. And I thought that that was extremely noteworthy. I couldn't agree more. Again, one of our most controversial episodes of Opening Arguments, uh, in which I was reviewing the uh, (coughs) serial and undisclosed podcast. And I made that point, right? And and I'll make it again here. And God, I hope you don't get the blowback that we got. But uh, I... I, Why are you going to do it? Yeah, because I think it's worth (laughs) saying. Um, There is no precise mathematical definition of what counts as reasonable doubt. Reasonable doubt can, is legally permissible, right? For it just to be... I don't know. That wasn't enough for me. Okay. But I will tell you in my review, and again, I'm not a criminal lawyer or whatever, but like I have, I've not had anybody point me to a criminal case in which uh, a defendant uh, is uh, found not guilty. And the reason is reasonable doubt. And there isn't some kind of compelling alternative narrative for what happened. Right. And that alternative narrative could be, 
I don't know, you haven't ruled out that somebody committed this, somebody else committed this crime. Or, I don't know, you haven't ruled out the fact that um, some of the evidence might have been fabricated, right? Like in the O.J. Simpson case, right? Like the the the, the way that Alan Dershowitz, God help us, uh, uh, characterized that case was uh, the cops framed a guilty man, right? Um, and if you think the cops framed a guilty man, you should say that that's reasonable doubt, right? Like that, that there were, right. There were stories, there were narratives, there were reasons to draw a conclusion. And, and here, if you're a juror, like, I mean, I put yourself in that, in that, in that jury room right now, like, what's your argument, right? What is at the outset, uh, that the defense was going to throw a whole bunch of stuff at the wall and see what stuck. Um, I don't think the drug stuff stuck. I don't think the, you know, tailpipe stuff stuck. I don't think the heart condition stuff stuck. Uh, I thought it was incredibly effective, uh, seeing the graph of the, you know, 17,200 days that, that George Floyd lived with all these conditions, you know, what makes today different than, than the rest of those. So, um, yeah. And, um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about these motions mm. for a mistrial because the defense called for a mistrial based on uh, the rebuttal of one thing, the rebuttal of prosecution saying the defense, you know, the, because the prosecution got up and used the word shaded, shaded the truth. Uh, they used the word nonsense uh, and that they were basically making up stories, which they did. Uh, but the judge said he sustained objections to those and it had been adequately addressed. OK, cool. Next argument. Then the defense says. Events over the past weekend that a congressperson made threats against the sanctity of the jury process, threatening and intimidating them, saying that if there wasn't a guilty verdict, there'd be, quote unquote, problems. And since the jury wasn't continually told to stay away from media and hasn't been sequestered, there's a probability that the jury has seen those comments and heard those comments. And one juror lives in Brooklyn Center. And then there was a little argument about that being true. And then uh, said, I just think the sum total of this trial happening in public context with the profound media attention, this case has made its way into fictional television, he said. I was advised of two television shows that specifically involved references to this case. He didn't mention the shows or the context. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I wanted to find out who the... Who, and he said the were. jury has been bombarded with elements of this case. It's impossible to stay away from. Uh, and the judge says... I told him not to watch the news. I don't know what to tell you. I told him not to watch the news. I explicitly told him. Yeah, but what about the TV shows? That's why I asked the jury to be sequestered. And that's why I'm moving for mistrial because of the profound media attention. On and on. This is about what Maxine Waters had said yeah. over the weekend. So. so so, let's deal with both of those, right? And the same standard is going to apply. And that is, is there a serious procedural error that results in an inability to do justice. And if that sounds kind of vague and flexibly to you, uh, it should. Um, a, a trial judge's opinion uh, as to whether to grant a mistrial is entitled to deference on appeal for precisely those reasons, right? And so, right, you can think about um, – what, you know, what kind of irregularities uh, during an argument, um, you know, would definitely lead to a mistrial, right? Like um, every episode of Perry Mason. Um, but but, you know, like suppose you have um, a piece of evidence that has been excluded. And the classic example of this would be, you know, you have a con you have a signed confession um, and uh, but it was produced under duress there were no there was no reading of the miranda rights the judge says no 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 that confession is staying the hell out and then you know in the heat of cross-examination uh you know the 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 defendant is on the stand by the way derek chauvin did not take the stand here but the defendant is on the stand uh and says you know uh i i definitely didn't do it and and the, you know the prosecution is like well that's not what you said in your confession is it right well at that point, no instruction from the judge is going to be sufficient to cure that prejudice, right? That's no, of course that's not. done and over mistrial, right? Saying they shaded the truth, or that kind of I could swear on the show, but still that kind of stuff. 
happens all the time. That's garden variety. That's nonsense. Yeah. And the, the judge said, hey, and I wish the judge had not said this, but the judge said, hey, I give you that what Congressman, I give you that Congressman <sighs> Waters may have given you something on appeal to overturn this whole case. But what does the prosecution say? And I'm like, what, 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 what? <sighs> um, that was weird. But what the prosecution said is, hey, we can't allow vague statements like this to be used. Uh, on appeal. If there's an exact statement, we need some kind of declaration. I'm sure Mr. Nelson could do that if he thinks it's appropriate. I don't know the context of Waters' statement. I don't know what TV shows he's even referring to. I don't think we can muddy the record without very specific evidence and without any sort of specific um, offer of proof in the record or evidence that is particular to this jury and that they were influenced in any particular way. I think this motion should be denied. And the judge said, yep, but motion denied. Yeah. And and so so let's get into the specific lawyering here and what and what you're talking about is basically how to preserve the record for appeal. Right. Because um, presumably when they lose, uh, Chauvin's lawyers will appeal this result. Um, and one of the bases, therefore, will be, oh, um, the the jury was impermissibly tainted uh, by outside media. And and here. All right. Maxine Waters, I pulled up the article, right, said on Saturday night, this is we're recording this on Monday, that protesters should, quote, stay on the street and, quote, get more confrontational if Derek Chauvin is acquitted. OK, um, I agree 100 percent with the judge's remarks in this case uh, that. That's not an appropriate thing for a sitting U.S. congressperson to say, right? It's a totally appropriate thing for us to say, right? Like, yeah, in media, you want to say like, hey, man, get it. You know, it, this would be a travesty if Chauvin is acquitted and get out there on the streets and protest. The judge said it was abhorrent, but the judge also said what the congressperson says doesn't matter. So he had he gave his personal opinion, which I don't think that that fucking matters a lick in this case <laughs> uh i don't think she should have said that okay fine thank you sir thank you your honor but also said what a congressperson says doesn't matter uh and he's right that's right and 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 look the state on appeal right defending this is going to have a pretty straightforward argument and the argument is going to be there was a, a shit ton of press coverage, both pro and con, about this case from the outset. Every single person knew about it. Every single person was instructed. And if your thought process is that this jury is swayed by media, then, you know, th then 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 from the start, right, you should have objected to the entirety of the trial, right? Like, th then nothing yeah, too makes late. sense. Yeah, too right. little, too late. And, and if you're going to do that, if they're going to overturn a conviction based on what a congressperson said, then you're going to have to review every single case where Congress people had something to say publicly that might have tainted a jury or a president or a vice president uh, or any other news for that matter. It's just not, I, it, in my opinion, it's just not going to happen. <sighs> so I, I I agree and and... Uh, but but I, I do want to give voice to the the argument because you can tweak the hypothetical and instantly see right the, the distinction. Um, and that is the Roger Stone trial. Donald Trump goes on television and says, I don't know if, if any jury finds Roger Stone guilty. Like, I, I sure wouldn't want to be those people. Right. Like, you know, and and very plainly says, like, if you're a, a mega supporting American, it's your and you're on that jury. It's your duty to acquit Roger Stone. Right. That that would be grounds for a mistrial. Right. That would be communications from the president of the United States to a sitting jury that that is designed to alter the out, the outcome of the case. The question is, is what Maxine Waters said, which, uh, again, no. yeah, and, and, was that and a no, communication that's why I say, to the jury? If you, if you grant an appeal and overturn the conviction based on what Maxine Waters says, you're going to open up a whole yeah. gaggle of appeals on previous shit that Trump said about certain stuff that doesn't rise to the occasion. So that I, that was just me yep. saying it's, no, it's no, no, just no, not no, going to yeah. happen. No, I, I agree with I agree with that. I was trying to make it clear, like, look, it it. 
there are ways to taint the jury pool. Mm-hmm. I just think that the argument is is not good in this case. So anti Maxine did not. <laughs> and uh, do, we, uh, do you think that in one minute you could tell us what a Blakely waiver is? Yes, I can do that super quickly. So um, Minnesota, uh, like the U.S. federal government, has sentencing guidelines. These are basically a matrix, and you get like the number of your offense in the row, and then the column is your criminal history, and it sharply curtails um, the discretion that the judge has to to impose a sentence greater than what's in the box. Okay, and what's in the box? What's in the box? Yeah, exactly. So, what's in the box on murder three, for example, is around eighty six months, right? About eight years. Um, the prosecution has said they intend, uh, particularly on murder three. It comes back murder two. It's going to be twenty plus years. It's going to be a lot. But, but the prosecution has said uh, they in, intend uh, to file for aggravating factors, right, and mm-hmm. to seek uh, an upward departure from the sentencing guidelines. Um, And so you have, as the defendant, the right to put that proof back before the jury on aggravating factors, right? So to ask the jury, hey, uh, does this meet the statutory criteria for deviating from the sentencing guidelines and deviating upward sentencing mean more harshly? Um, a Blakely waiver is when a criminal defendant says, I voluntarily waive my right to go before the jury, and I will instead let the judge decide whether those factors have been met. And no okay. surprise, Chauvin wants to do that here. <laughs> yeah. Right. The jury's not going to help him on that. <laughs> no. And I lied. I do have one more. Oh, uh, question done. Uh, there, there are th- three charges here, right? Second degree uh, murder, third degree murder, th- second degree manslaughter. Correct. Is that right? Yeah. And they can be found. He can be found guilty on all three, and all three have numbers in the box that you can decide how many uh, years they're going to do. Now, is it the judge's dis- decision to uh, as to whether or not the defendant serves those? charge those years consecutively or uh concurrently because like if you have a a 10 years on the higher charge and a six years on the lower charge that doesn't mean 16 years automatically right he could just say 10 because the six is is subsumed into that 10 we saw it a lot in the Mueller case yep and um in a in, in a normal case involving sentencing guidelines um you you have some argument back and forth over uh, that computation here. Uh, it is only the top line offense. Uh, 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 Chauvin is only going to be sentenced for the top line offense because the others are lesser included offenses. They stem out of the same common core nucleus of operative facts. Mm. So he will not be sentenced on even if found guilty on all three, then he will be sentenced on the murder, too. So effectively, it would be concurrent. It will be not at all. Right. It's it's they're they're lesser included offenses. Oh, so there is no option for consecutive. No. The way to get cool. the additional time is through uh, the sentencing ag- aggravation. Right. And that's where he <laughs> waived his right. And to that's where right. and and that, to... <laughs> uh, did, that will be. They'll brief that before the judge. Yeah. yeah. All right. Makes sense to me. Thank you for explaining that. Everybody will be right back after this uh, with more news. Stay with us. Hey, everybody. It's AG. And today's episode of Clean Up on Aisle 45 is brought to you by Lucy. Lucy Nicotine is a company founded by Caltech scientists and former smokers looking for a better and cleaner nicotine alternative. Finally, tobacco alternatives that don't suck. Lucy was researched and developed for three years to be made for people, not patients. Lucy has created a gum with four milligrams of nicotine that comes in three flavors, wintergreen, cinnamon, and pomegranate, as well as a lozenge with a cherry ice flavor. Each and every flavor tastes great. One of my best friends has struggled with cigarettes for years. I recently recommended trying Lucy, and she absolutely loves it, especially the wintergreen. It's 2021. Get rid of your cigarettes, unplug your vape, throw out your dip, and get some Lucy nicotine gum or lozenges. This is the real deal. A subscription to Lucy comes directly to your door each month. It's simple. You don't have to leave your house because Lucy has delivery down. Clean up on aisle 45 listeners. Go to lucy.co and use promo code CLEANUP to get 20% off all the products on your first order, including gum or lozenges. That's lucy.co and use promo code cleanup at checkout. Also, I have to give this disclaimer. Warning, this product contains nicotine derived from tobacco. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. Go to lucy.co and be sure to use that promo code cleanup. 
Everyone, welcome back. So, cleaning up on aisle 45 has a lot of different components to it. Uh, you've got to undo the previous guy's policies. A lot with, you know, remember the old meme, I unfuck this, unfuck these things, unfuck that. <laughs> Uh, A lot of that has been done by executive order, but much more will depend on, of course, administrative agency actions, policy, right? You need to root out the cronies embedded and or burrowed in the civil (laughs) service who support the previous guy's stuff. And we'll be be covering that in the D block with our usual comings and goings. Bye bye. Uh, But then the hard part is actually making progress, issuing your own rules, generating regulations and policy and standard operating procedure and findings going forward. And today we're going to talk about Climate change, because it's Earth Day. (laughs) Yeah. On Friday, we learned that uh, Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland, revoked a series of Trump administration orders that promoted fossil fuel development on public lands and waters and issued a separate directive that prioritizes climate change in agency decisions. What a what a what a welcome uh, departure for that. (sighs) Holland said, quote, From day one, President Biden was clear that we must take a whole of government approach to tackle the climate crisis, strengthen the economy and address environmental justice. End of quote. And I look, we're going to delve into it. I think it's pretty clear that the Biden administration is not just talking the talk, but walking the walk on climate change. Yes, so far. And and the new orders that he has issued revoke. First, the former guy's directives that facilitated coal, oil and gas leasing on federal lands as part of what Trump called U.S. energy dominance. (laughs) Yeah, extreme. Uh, Number two, uh, rescinded uh, the former guy's administrative order intended to increase oil drilling in Alaska's National Petroleum Reserve. And three, rescinded a 2017 order that in turn revoked an Obama-era moratorium on federal coal reserve sales, meaning that moratorium goes back into effect. So somebody (laughs) did it, Obama blocked it, Trump unblocked it. Biden's re-blocking it. Yes. <laughs> that, that's kind of what's happening. No, that, that that's exactly right. And um, and look, like the first two are pretty straightforward, right? Like Republicans want more and cheaper leasing of fossil fuels on federal lands and sensible people want less. Um, but but I, I want to talk about that third one for a second and not just because it's an undoing of an undoing of it, right? Like, <laughs> um, but but. I really think it shows that this administration is willing to spend political capital on this fight. And and look like that's what we've asked for. Right. Yep. That That is the progressive position opposite Joe Biden. Hey, show us that you believe that, you know, in the. Uh, words of the bulletin of the atomic scientists like it's a hundred seconds to midnight right like we're terrified of impending climate change um and rightly so so um let's talk about the strategic coal reserve for just a second it it's it's not like a giant like scrooge mcduck vault full of coal (laughs) right like it's land right it's land that we think has coal on it And so the idea when this was created in, I don't know, 1895, was that if we ran out or if the market squeezed us out or whatever, we'd have coal independence, right? Because the federal government owns a lot of land with a ton of coal buried beneath it. How much? 473 billion tons of coal. Um, That's a lot. What do you get? (laughs) Nice. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, (laughs) <laughs> outstanding uh, 16 tons reference there. Um, thank you. I thank you because uh, I owe my soul to the company store. Indeed. <laughs> so um, estimates are that maybe like a little over half of that is actually mineable. Uh, but look, the key thing is people have to actually want to mine this coal. And right now, um, given that natural gas is way cheaper to produce, even among big coal producers, almost nobody actually wants these leasing rights, right? So, but what about the clean coal? Can't we wash the coal? Like Trump <laughs> yeah. said, we just wash the coal. Um, I seem to recall that when the moratorium first went into effect in 2016, Republicans freaked the hell out. They called it a war on coal by Democrats and, you know, implied we were selling out our energy independence to China or something. I mean, it was absolutely war on coal, coal in the ground, unmined coal. 
that for some reason they think you it, you just magically comes up out of the ground. We just wash it a little bit, clean coal. Yeah. So uh, it turns out none of that was correct, right? Um, and and look, like <laughs> key point, right? The moratorium was issued in 2016, right? Like we're not, this is we're not talking about uh, a a a long history of having done something positive. Um, reinstating that moratorium though is really important because nobody has done any fact finding on the coal leases pursuant to the strategic coal reserve in 40 years right like i don't even know i tried to find out and what that means is like the terms of those leases haven't changed since the 1970s and like we kind of know a hell of a lot more now about the environment than we did in the 1970s right so so look it it's crucial that we have a moratorium um had the election gone a different way in 2016, Boost. then uh, <laughs> uh, then 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 I think right. The purpose of a moratorium is to then conduct fact finding and see. No, yeah, <laughs> like like what what the implications are here, and that's what we're that's what the Biden administration is putting back into place. So this is something that look like they're going to take a huge hit. It we cannot say right away that this moratorium is going to make the environment better. Right. But it's an important thing that you have to do behind the scenes. Um, and even though this plays into the right wing's narrative, like I, I love the fact that the Biden administration is like, all right, bring it. Yeah. Yeah. Bring it is is kind of pretty much there. That was kind of, kind of is reminiscent of, you know, when he, when he was like, oh, you don't think I can fire you? I can fire you. You can assume me. I'll pay it. Bring it. Remember? Yep. I mean, we talked about that in the comings and going section. But uh, as it, uh, it's, I should note here, right, that the Department of the Interior continues to review proposals for oil, gas, coal, and renewable energy development on public lands and waters. Mm -hmm. It's just that now the environmental impact number isn't going to be set to zero. Right. <laughs> according to according to PBS, environmental groups praised the orders and promised to work with Secretary Holland to ensure the Interior Department decisions are guided by science. They guided me with science. Uh, and consider respect for indigenous communities, wildlife, outdoor recreation, and other uses. And that you know that's what Democrats do. Yep. And and look, um, part of Sec uh, Secretary Holland's uh, analysis was that this was a whole of government issue. Interior right covers federally owned lands, right? And more than twenty five percent of all U.S. greenhouse gas emissions originate on public lands, right? And leasing on those lands. So that's a pretty significant component of, of our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and those same environmental groups have argued that um, we can not only stop doing bad stuff, right? Uh, but that we can use natural lands uh, to restore natural carbon sinks that take carbon out of the atmosphere, um, to deploy clean energy solutions, uh, and re actually reduce existing emissions rather than just not getting as worse. So, you know, it's a big deal. <laughs> yeah. It's not just, you know, like <laughs> when I took up over some uh, writing customer service guidelines in the government, uh, the, the, the current thing that I, I walked into, their, their, their policy was basically don't be a dick, right? And I was like, hey, can we turn that into you actually have to be nice? Right. And, and <laughs> I, I, fought, I fought a good battle, but I won, right? I won that. And that's what this reminds me of because it's so, it, it, I, mean, I mean, that sort of concept in that you come in and, and you're not just bringing it down to, to you know, like taking away the bad stuff. You can add good stuff and on top of that, add jobs to add the good stuff, right? That, that give back the economy, increase tax revenue, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, it's 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 kind of an exponential thing that's happening here. And it's what we've been talking about as Democrats for years now, for decades. We can uh, not just save jobs. We can convert jobs, create more jobs and save the planet at the same time. Why doesn't anybody get this? I I couldn't have said it better myself. So I, I, I'll i just endorse what you said. I and Look. <laughs> I think, I mean, to me, the bottom line takeaway is I think we have multiple independent lines of evidence that um, this is a real priority to the administration. And, um, 
you know, that's not a thing you could say about the Clinton administration, for example. It's not a thing you could say for the most part about the Obama administration in terms of being a frontline priority. Did that, did, did, you know, are the, were the policies much better? Sure, they were. But was it, you know, mission one? I don't know. Here seems pretty clear that it's high on the priority list. Yeah. And, and I'm grateful. Too. So, everybody, we're going to be right back after this quick break. We're going to, uh, after when we come back, we're going to be talking with former assistant director of the FBI for counterintelligence, author of the book The FBI Way, Frank Figluzzi, will be <laughs> joining us. We're going to talk about some really interesting news that has come out about some of the insurrectionists. So, stick around. We'll be right back. Hey, everybody, it's AG for Cleanup on All 45. A few decades ago, private citizens used to be largely that private. What has changed? The internet. Think about everything you browsed, searched for, watched, or tweeted, posted on Facebook. Now imagine all that data being looked through, collected, and aggregated to third parties into permanent public record. Your public record. Having your private life exposed for others to see was once something only celebrities worried about. But in an era where everyone is online, everyone's a public figure. And to keep my data private when I go online, I turn to ExpressVPN. There are hundreds of data brokers out there whose sole business it is to buy and sell your data. They don't have to tell you what they're selling it to or who they're selling it to, and they don't even have to get your consent. Data harvesters use your IP to uniquely identify you and your location. But with ExpressVPN, my connection gets routed through an encrypted server and my IP address is masked. Take that, data harvesters. Every time I turn ExpressVPN on, I am a random IP address, making it more difficult for third parties to identify me and get my data. The best part, ExpressVPN is so easy to use. No matter what your device you're on, your phone, your laptop, your smart TV, all you have to do is tap one button to get protected. So, if, like me, you believe your data is your business, secure yourself with the number one rated VPN on the market. Visit expressvpn.com slash cleanup and get three extra months for free. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash cleanup. That's expressvpn.com slash cleanup to learn more. All right, everybody. Welcome back to Clean Up on Aisle 45. Today, Andrew and I have the pleasure of talking to a former associate director of the FBI for counterintelligence, author of the incredible book, The FBI Way. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend picking it up. And host of the upcoming podcast, The Bureau. Please welcome Frank Figluzzi. Frank, hello. Hey, thanks for having me. First time on uh, on this one, but uh Glad you're along for the ride as well, AJ. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I feel like I'm on a lot of ride-alongs these days. Um, I, I just can't get my head up there on MSNBC. I know you're pulling for me. I'm but uh, <laughs> You're like, well, she's an expert. What is What specifically? Oh, just sort of anything, really. Um, but we're working on it. But I, I'm so happy that we're going to get to talk to you today because you—, you You've been following this very closely, and you penned an article today for MSNBC about what's going on with the insurrection, and specifically this recent plea agreement, the first public pre, uh, plea agreement or cooperation agreement. And I think public is the important uh, statement here. Uh, and I, I will I be want to ask you if you think there could be other plea agreements we don't know about yet, but this is the first public one, and you wrote a piece on it. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, Mr. Schaefer? Yeah, sure. I did um, write a piece over the weekend. came out came out today for MSNBC Daily. Uh, I've tweeted it, and so have so have they. Here's the deal. Um, my point is this: this isn't just your average run of the mill guilty plea. Um, first of all, there was an accident. Um, accidentally, the federal court database was visible when it shouldn't have been, and that gave insights to reporters, it was up only briefly, that there is a cooperation agreement here, um, and that the defendant has pled guilty to two felonies and has agreed to cooperate with the government. And we've learned that the prosecution feels his potential cooperation is so significant that they've told the judge they're willing to sponsor him for witness protection. So let's let's go back and talk about who this guy is. This is not your run-of-the-mill Looney Tunes Oath Keeper member. This is a self-proclaimed, he's told the court, I am a founding member of Oath Keepers. So this is somebody who is way back, uh, probably about a dozen years in the existence of, of Oath Keepers. You, you listeners are savvy enough to know that Oath Keepers is filled with law enforcement and military, active and former. And so there's lots to learn from this guy if he keeps his cooperation agreement. Not the least of which, AG, is, hey, um, who was pulling the strings? Who was funding this? Who around the Trump circle knew what the plans were for the insurrection? Please let us know. Remember, the Oath Keepers 
are people who've provided security on the very day of the insurrection for a guy by the name of Roger Stone. No, who? <laughs> who is that? Yeah, Roger Stone. Yeah. Roger Stone, the guy, the, the guy that was pardoned before the insurrection. Happened. Right. That right. Guy? That guy where the where oh. the pardon would not apply to future crimes. So Stone is sweating, um, I would think, with the notion that this guy's cooperating. Also, we might learn things like the degree of coordination between Looney Tunes groups like Oath Keepers and Proud Boys and the Three Percenters, all of whom the government has hinted at uh, were indeed coordinating and communicating on the insurrection. And then lastly, from a straight up intelligence standpoint, we'd love to know how Oath Keepers recruits current and former uh, law enforcement and military, because that would allow us to counter extremism better. Oh, Frank, so much that I want to dig down on in terms of what you've just said. Um, uh, one of the things that you said that I th- I thought was incredibly interesting is um, that 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 the government has hinted uh, at a uh, a broad collaboration by and among the Oath Keepers, the Three Percenters, the Proud Boys. Um, other other than um, the way in which that evidence was adduced during the second impeachment hearing, which I thought was incredibly effective in terms of laying a groundwork with with the public. Um, it, it, do you mean that there's additional evidence that's come to light uh, that that DOJ is looking into that from a prosecutorial standpoint? Yes, indeed. In okay. fact, in, in today's column, I, I include a link to that evidence pre- presented by prosecutors already in court documents that in another Oath Keepers case, by the way, that that talks in detail about at least 10 or 12 emails between Oath, an Oath Keepers member and Proud Boys, where the Oath Keepers member proudly tells his, his team, Hey, just uh, just communicate with Proud Boys. They'll turn out. They always do. And they're talking specifically about January 6th. So um, absolutely, the government has evidence of coordination. That's that's the Kelly Meggs case. That's correct. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And 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 sketch out a little bit what what uh, what that kind of a prosecution could look like. Yeah. What I'm seeing evidence of here. Let's remember what a guilty plea means and a cooperation agreement means when there's a cooperation agreement in place, it means that the prosecution cares a whole lot more about working their way upwards and the information that defendant can provide than they do about nailing that single defendant with a maximum sentence. So they've already made that decision. And you sit there and you go, wow, so they're going to, they're willing to cut a break to a founding member of Oath Keepers. They must place great value on what he can provide. And what I see happening here is what's prosecutors refer to as an enterprise theory of investigation, which means that that they're not going to take one single act by single defendants in isolation, but rather I think this is hinting at, hey, when, when Oath Keepers, when founding members, when planners and coordinators do these crimes, they do it on behalf of the organization. And, and the enterprise theory says it's it's we're about taking down and dismantling this criminal enterprise, not just single hmm. defendants. That's uh, really fascinating because I know, too, with all three and multiple more groups uh, involved in this and the coordination and the communication they show that they have, uh, a judge today actually uh, revoked the bail of Biggs and I believe Nordine, who are proud boys, who uh, and, and then, you know, Andrew, you brought up the Megs thing. And so this I mean, these are all interconnected and what this witness could give could be extremely valuable, like you said, not just for prosecuting this case, not just for rolling up, not just for getting f- information on funding, but how to dismantle the organization itself. And I, a question for you. I remember I remember that day when we accidentally saw something that was supposed to be under seal. Uh, and now we have a public cooperation agreement. And I'm wondering if they weren't forced to take this cooperation agreement public and, and bring up the witness protection program because of that error. And it makes me wonder, could there be other plea agreements and cooperation agreements that they didn't make mistakes with that are still under seal. We've seen several, uh, for example, uh, indictments on the docket that are still sealed. And we've also seen other, uh, what are they called, charging information documents that that have come out, which don't 
automatically mean a plea agreement, but can generally lead in that direction. And that's what we saw in this particular case with Schaefer, too, was a uh, a charging information document. Uh, These are great questions. Um, And we'd be engaging in conjecture here, but I think it's certainly within the realm of possibility. My favorite. (laughs) Conjecture, right? Yeah. It's within the realm of possibility that the public, the accidental public disclosure of this cooperation agreement may have caused the prosecution to say, uh, hey, this guy may be, get put in witness protection. But I but I have to tell you, it's probably where this was headed anyway, because the nature of this guy and the cooperation would eventually come to light, um, quite likely. And they probably were prepared to do that. What intrigues me, and, and let me quickly say, with regard to your second question, might there be um, non-public cooperation agreements? Yeah, so I, I think it's reasonable to assume that that there are some non-public cooperation agreements only because it looks like they may not have wanted to disclose this one that we're talking about. And the other thing that intrigues me about both of these questions is the risk that people are, uh, that, that people put themselves in when they're part of these groups. So is it, is witness protection even being discussed because uh, the obvious is in place? Cops, former cops, guns, military guns, um, people who are violent, um, will be upset when they find that their former colleague is is ratting them out. That's obvious. But is there more to it? Is there the possibility that people in power with a whole lot to lose um, will be very incensed if he has information to provide about their involvement? I think all of this may play into it. Don't forget, Roger Stone himself is someone who's on who's been documented as threatening um, someone. Um, a la, he will kill your dog and will kill yeah, your me. dog um, <laughs> with reference to, um, I think, uh, the Godfather movies. So, yeah, dangerous people. And um, we may find somebody or more than just one person in, ending up in Witsec as a result of this. Yeah. Um, let's let's drill down a little bit on the the enterprise theory of criminal liability here. Um, it, and and let me combine that with uh maybe a, a pessimist question right <laughs> and i because i just want to i just want to give give voice to sort of both sides um ag and i both took the same approach when uh it was publicly announced uh in the Mueller investigation that they'd cut a deal with michael flynn and it was like oh well he's pretty high up the chain and you know and i spoke to a couple of prosecutors i'm a i'm a civil defense attorney. So, you know, it, it, it's uh, a little bit outside of my bailiwick. Uh, but, you know, I pulled on prosecutors who who kind of echoed the same theory of, uh, yeah, like, you you know, you cut, a, you cut a deal to go up the ladder, not to go down. And, there, you know, there weren't too many spots above the ladder uh, above Michael Flynn. Um, turned out not to be the case. Right. Um, we, we and And obviously there are a lot of <laughs> um, circumstances surrounding Flynn, uh, but uh, but 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 let's but so let's sort of talk about both of that, like in in, in the context of um, if um, if Schaefer is not giving up somebody higher up the ladder, how could his testimony be useful in? other cases in, you know, in other ways that are maybe sort of less visible than thinking about, you know, he's, he's going to say, oh yeah, I've got, I've got a copy of an email from, you know, Roger Stone to, to Donald Trump saying, you know, the fix is in Mm -hmm. and uh, the Oath Keepers are ready to stand back and stand by. Yep. So first, let me just, just uh, echo your um, professional pessimism. (laughs) I, I, I too, I'm a, I'm a, cynic by by nature and 25 years in counterintelligence has led me to believe that you know I, if bad things are going to happen they'll they'll happen and more so than the good things that might happen so what are the general um uh, benefits of somebody like Schaefer cooperating look beyond individual subjects and cases i mentioned at the start here the notion of counter extremism counter radicalization and learning a whole lot more about what it is that attracts the military and the police to a group like this. But even more importantly, if he can give up names and places, who is in active duty military, who is in active duty law enforcement, what departments or units are more prone to this than others, give us places, give us names. Um, This is tremendous uh, intelligence value. And that alone in my opinion, would constitute a, a cooperation agreement. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's sort of what I was thinking at first, especially with the witness protection thing. I'm like, not trying to protect him from 
higher ups. They're trying to protect him from other Oath Keepers, three percenters, Proud Boys. And and also the intelligence, like you said, that he could hand over on these groups, how they're formed, who's recruiting, who's funding. I think that is valuable enough to to prosecutors uh, for, you know, for a plea agreement that's not rolling up on anybody. I mean, he may. And that, you know, and that's a that's a different story. But you, I don't think in this particular case, it has to be a bigger fish in order for it to be a plea agreement. Oh, I, I agree. Um, and and think about if he gets into funding, think about the possibility that maybe he has hey, he has some knowledge of foreign funding sources um, or Republican Party uh, funding sources. This is, and there's laundering involved. And now, you know, now we're getting into criminal potential <laughs> cases. Um, and then the enterprise itself, what is Oath Keepers? Where are their assets? Are they offshore assets? How much assets do they have? How many do do members pay dues? Can we dismantle? Well, one of the ways you dismantle an enterprise, of course, is you seize their assets. And where are they? He can help. With, he may, he may be a signator on, on an account somewhere. It's all great stuff. Yeah. And, and with the idea that, this might not be the only cooperation, just the only public one we know about. I think that even expands it more. So, uh, Andrew, do you have any final questions uh, for Frank before we get out of here? <laughs> yeah, I just I have to. I <laughs> no, no. Well, I could I could go on, Frank. I love having you on, and and I I feel like we could go on forever. I I I've got to ask you. You have described well. You're you're quoting uh, from the plea deal, but uh, John Ryan Schaefer as a quote founding lifetime member. <laughs> of the Oath Keepers. And I'm wondering, um, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> well, I think I think uh, there's free roadside service for the warranty yeah, of your right, car right. Uh, with that. But, but I look, the guy wore a hat, unless, unless we need any further legal documentation. The picture of him at the insurrection is with a hat that says founding lifetime <laughs> member. So, and then he said it to the court. Um, what does it mean? Again, it's back to the cooperation yeah. agreement. He was in at the beginning, as they say. Um, and uh, maybe he wrote the Articles of Confederation. I have no idea. But um, <laughs> I'm sure he'll shed some light on that. And there'll be hours of confounding interviews by FBI agents and prosecutors. Yeah, no, but I, I, I think your point is really, really well taken. Uh, and it is it is an undercovered story, uh, the, the degree to which present law enforcement are members of these kinds of groups. Um, and I know, you know, our, our, we're called clean up on all 45, right? Like our audience is um, waiting for justice, uh, as I, I think I, I would put it, uh, with respect to, to members of the past administration. Uh, but, but I certainly agree with you that, that, I mean, there's a, there's a structural problem that, um, that needs to be fixed going forward. Well, and and look on on the general theme of, of of your podcast and cleaning up. Look look at the pipeline we've created um, through veterans preference, which by the way I'm a big fan of. Um, but for, straight from the military to the police departments, you you get a I, I have immediate family members who got a bump because of their military service into law enforcement, and that's fantastic. I did, but not into law enforcement, just into yeah, the yeah. Department of Veterans Affairs. But into, <laughs> right, but, 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 in, and that's great, but into law enforcement, particularly in many departments, that is like the only way you get a bump on your, your ranking in the candidate list. And so fantastic, but now we're taking not only combat trained people, but people who are in, you know, the Pentagon is in stand down mode because of white supremacist concerns and extremism concerns. Now we're feeding those combat trained people that come from a white supremacist extremist potentially problem environment, and we're giving them the, the top ranking in the candidate list for their city police department. That that needs to somehow get examined and looked at if we're going to reform the police. And and we are multiply incentivizing local police departments to purchase surplus military hardware. So I it, right that need well that needs to get cut down too. I mean there are university police departments yeah. who have who have armored personnel carriers and and you know you've got to be kidding me. Yeah. Yeah, but they won't prosecute a rape. Mm, okay, cool. Mm, true. Uh it's just my own little no. just had to get that dig in there. All right, well th- Thank you so much for joining us uh, today. Everybody, check out, first of all, this article on MSNBC Daily. It's really great. And then also the book, The FBI Way. And I have to tell you, it's not just about the FBI. It actually has so much information in there about how to run a business, how to uh, manage a project. It's It, it applies to so many things. And, and 
I really, really recommend you take a uh, take a listen to it. I, I do all my audiobooks. Get that book. And then, of course, teaser, you have a new podcast coming out called The Bureau, which I, I'm really excited to hear. And so, uh, everybody, thank you so much. Uh, let's see if I get this right. Former assistant director of the FBI for counterintelligence. Did I get it? You got that right. And, uh, yeah, coming coming to a podcast platform near you, launching next month. Yeah. The Bureau with Frank Figaluzzi, taking you inside the corners of the FBI that you've never seen before. Yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, thank you so much, Frank Figaluzzi. All right. Thanks, everybody. Frank, thank you. Take care. Everybody, we'll be right back right after this. Hey, everybody. Today's episode of Clean Up on 45 is brought to you by the most useful app on my phone. It's my new favorite life hack. It's called Blinkist. Sometimes finding the time to read or work on personal development can be very tricky when you're extremely busy. But Blinkist is designed to solve that problem. Blinkist is a unique app that works on your phone, tablet, or web browser. It takes the best key takeaways, that need-to-know crucial information from thousands of nonfiction books, and condenses it into just 15 minutes so you can read that or listen to that. Most successful people are known to be voracious readers, and Blinkist has made made for busy people it's they, who want to get the main points of a book quickly and start using the information right away. And with its audio feature, Blinkist make it, makes it easy to finish a book while driving or working out. 12 million people are using Blinkist right now. It has a massive and growing library from self-help, business, health, and history. Blinkist has the latest titles from bestsellers as well as the classic nonfiction titles you always meant to get to but never had time. I like it because in 15 minutes, I get the main points, and it helps me evaluate which books I want to read in full later. I recently read Fire and Fury, as you know, Inside the Trump White House by Michelle Wolf, and uh, it was fascinating and terrifying, like the show Westworld, but with incompetence. <laughs> With Blinkist, you get unlimited access to read or listen to a massive library of condensed books, nonfiction books, all the books you want for one low price. Right now, for a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash cleanup, try it free for seven days, and you'll save 25% off on your new subscription. That's Blinkist, B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T dot com slash cleanup to start your seven-day trial for free. And you also save 25% off, but only when you sign up at Blinkist.com slash cleanup. And welcome back to Clean Up on Aisle 45. That was a fantastic interview with Frank. Mm-hmm. I, uh, that was that was so much fun. Uh, but now we've got to get to our favorite segment, Comings and Goings. <laughs> yes. And uh, let's start off with some arrivals. Ooh, right? Arriving. The most welcome of which is the fact that Joe Biden has formally submitted his first 10 judicial nominees. Nine to the federal bench and one to the D.C. Superior Court. That's the D.C. State Trial Court. My personal favorite here is what I had predicted. I had put beans on this. <laughs> Judge K- uh, Katanji Brown Jackson has been nominated to fill Merrick Garland's seat on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, teeing her up. Right. I mean, this tees her up because he he made a promise that the, the D.C. Circuit is. Uh, the minor leagues to the Supremes, uh, and she is absolutely a rock star. Love to see this. Um, we actually broke down all of these picks in depth, if you don't mind the plug, on episode 478 of Opening Arguments. You should be listening to all three of our collective shows here. <laughs> uh, but if you haven't, go check that one out. Um, these are tremendous picks, right? Uh, Nutgraph is... Biden is playing hardball. There is not a single generic white dude among these first 10 appointments. Um, In fact, eight are women. Um, The overwhelming majority are women of color. It's a great list. They're all going to get confirmed. Uh, Probably not a lot of Republican votes. uh, And uh, good. (laughs) And good. Yeah. Uh, And anticipatory welcome to Christine Warmoth. This is President Biden's pick to be the next secretary of the army. Uh, if confirmed, and she will be, she will be the first woman to ever hold the position of Secretary of the Army. And to think, Andrew, this job almost went as a patronage position to Steve Kalk, right? <laughs> the delusional <laughs> Illinois banker who bribed Paul Manafort, remember? Oh, that where, he, guy. where he sent a list of shit he wanted to be uh, with a check for $18 million to Paul Manafort. And he's like, ambassador to the Bahamas, uh, secretary of the army. And you're like, really? <laughs> Uh, really, Steve? Yeah, Iron Man was on that list. It was very weird. Yeah, <laughs> and and my favorite thing is that he was the whole reason he was indicted is because all the fucking evidence about his dealings came out when he was getting a divorce from his yep. wife who left him. So, yep, yep. Yeah. And Ag, since uh, since you're a vet and a woman, and you have no time for this kind of bullshit, I will tackle our listeners, Uncle Frank's sexist objections. Uh, 
All right. <laughs> Thank you. Listen up. Huddle in. Right. Christine Wormuth, uh, previously the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy in the Obama administration. And by the way, those policy areas were strategy, plans, and force development, not uh, bacon cookies. Uh, prior to that, she was a senior director and special assistant to the president at the National Security Council. Um, and during the other guy's term, she was hired to be the director of the Rand Corporation's International Security and, S- and Defense Policy Center. Um, that's a ridiculously qualified resume for <laughs> yeah. Secretary of the Army. Uh, and anybody who says otherwise uh, is just uh, sexist garbage. Yeah. I mean, what was Stephen Cox's resume? You know, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I was a, I'm a veteran and I worked at a bank and now I run a bank. <laughs> Word. I loaned all of our reserves to, to Paul Manafort. <laughs> yeah, a quarter of our profit. And that kind of judgment, yeah. Is, yeah. <laughs> oh, God, that guy. Uh, oh. <laughs> and finishing up our warm welcomes, Biden also announced that Susanna Bloom has been picked as the department's director of cost assessment and program evaluation. And Gil Cisneros has been chosen for Undersecretary of Defense, Personnel and Readiness. Welcome aboard. So the... Those are our arrivals. Uh, Now we get to turn to the equally fun goings. Our first, our first bye bye, and you get to drill down on this one a little bit. So our first bye bye is to Betsy Weatherhead. She has a had a leadership role at the White House Office of Science Technology Policy. Uh, She was brought on board by a Trump political appointee, Kevin Drogemeyer, (laughs) and yes. Her responsibilities at the Office of Science Technology Policy. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Take a wild guess. Okay. Because I was going to make a joke. I'm like, I could hear the former guy saying, hmm, who should I nominate to be in charge of weather? How about Betsy Weatherhead? She sounds qualified. <laughs> <laughs> well, kind of. Yeah. She led the federal government's report on the effects of climate change. So you, uh, you have <laughs> successfully sussed out the mind of... Donald J. Trump. I don't know if that deserves an award or a rubber room, but uh, there you go. Oh, 100%. Come on, weatherhead, climate change. It's perfect. It's from Central Casting. Uh, we should note publicly, uh, both Weatherhead and Drogemeyer at least admitted that climate change was real and not, you know, a Chinese hoax. Uh, but that doesn't excuse their policy actions, which... Uh, dr- Drogemeyer routinely slashed government efforts to combat climate change all over the place. And Weatherhead tried to water down the aforementioned report and include more authors from the private sector, which, <laughs> gosh, we saw all over the EPA, didn't we? Yeah. Pretty much the, the, the last thing the Trump administration needed, honestly. Yeah. No, that's right. Look, like, here's the bottom line. Weatherhead was a career public policy person, right? Biden could have kept her on and in an administration that was not paying super close attention to these sorts of things she might have slipped through the cracks right like this is this does not you know jump up and scream at you uh of you know embedded bad actor but this administration really does want a complete reversal on climate change and that means replacing even the non-crazy conservatives so uh goodbye to you betsy weatherhead (laughs) I can't believe you fired Weatherhead. She was perfect (laughs) for climate change. I will never tire of you doing Trump on Weatherhead. (laughs) (laughs) It's my new memoir, Trump on Weatherhead. Just hours of me talking about how great Weatherhead is going to be on climate change. Uh, Yeah, no, I think he's he's digging deep into these into these. uh, uh, These employees and, and rooting out where science isn't being supported and where science doesn't support the authorship of these policies. It's really incredible. Uh, So happy Earth Day, everybody. And I know people are going to give me shit about April 21st being Earth Day, but I go back to the old song. It's April 21st and everybody knows today is Earth Day. Merry Christmas. Happy birthday to whoever's being born. So that's when I celebrate. But we should (laughs) celebrate every day, honestly. All right, here's a weird one. Thanks to Ryan J. Riley, we have an investigative summary, number 21, TAC 061, documenting findings of misconduct by a then-senior DOJ official for failing to appear on multiple occasions for interviews with the Office of the Inspector General. That's Horowitz. That's our good old, good old Inspector General Horowitz. After what the report describes as several unsuccessful attempts to schedule a voluntary interview with the official... The Office of the Inspector General instructed the official to appear for a compelled interview, and then that person decided to quit 
instead. Yeah. And and look, we should be clear here that even in the compulsory interview, right, that's what was pending. The official was told this is this is OIG required policy, quote, neither the answers they provided nor any evidence gained by reason of those answers could be used against you in a criminal proceeding. Right. That's blanket immunity. Um, That's. Part of what the OIG has to do as part of its delegated authority in order to compel testimony from current DOJ employees. And they still decided to quit. So you draw your own conclusions. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And that doesn't mean that the Department of Justice can't open up a separate investigation, by the way. Uh, It all depends on who that person was. Beans on Tim Shea. (laughs) Oh, you got beans on Tim Shea, huh? I was thinking uh, Tim Shea or maybe um, Clark, yeah. Jeffrey Bosart Clark. I, yeah, uh, he is all over the place in terms of, uh, you know, his fingerprints are all over the place in terms of, uh, you know, sleazy DOJ stuff. Tim, I, Tim just, you know, having having seen his signature every time uh bill barr needed somebody to come in and you know pinch hit for the latest round of terrible things being delegated uh was was my uh was my thought but we we do we do not know um and and unless the doj opens up an investigation for independent reasons we will never know because the OIG cannot compel or subpoena testimony from former DOJ employees, even if they resign in the middle of an investigation, which seems to be the case here. They can turn over. Right. So, you know, we'll we'll see. Um, but uh, this may this may stay like, you know, the mystery of the Bermuda Triangle. Here but something. wasn't Biden trying to get it so that inspectors general could compel former government employees to to. Answer questions. I would need to go back to the statutory delegation of authority here, but I think that um, OIG has not been delegated that power outside no, of yeah. They haven't, but I think they want it. Oh, okay. And I think it's been brought up. Uh, um, that's got to pass Congress. This could though. be anyone working under McEntee. Remember mm. that dickhead. <laughs> this could be uh, any. U.S. attorney, I mean, yep. you know, Sherwin, Shea, like you said, could be could have to do with that. Um, even even G. Zachary Terwilliger, who knows? Who <laughs> Terwilliger could be the Atlanta firing. Remember that whole oh, yeah. thing that was being investigated? I mean, there's a lot of it, it would be hard to nail this down. Funny. Don't don't have a corrupt DOJ. And then that would make this easy. Gosh, but. right. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. All right, A.G., I saved this one for last for you because it's the best. Oh, thank you. It's the best. Okay. So so yesterday we learned that Michael Ellis, general counsel for the National Security Agency, finally resigned after having been placed on administrative leave since January 20th, a date that <laughs> you ought to recognize. Yeah. And and if the name Michael Ellis is familiar to you, and I, I can see you giggling already, it's because he's one of these 30-year-old Devin Nunes groupies who, you know, deeply regret the racist and sexist stuff they said last week, right? They suck at their jobs and they keep falling upward, right? Ellis was the guy that was in charge of vetting Bolton's manuscript um, and was so incompetent that the most conservative judge on the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia, that's Royce Lambert, again, someone in front of whom I've argued and lost, uh, essentially said, well, uh, I would love to block publication of Bolton's manuscript, but um, since you did such a terrible job of vetting the confidential information, there's nothing I can do. Um, and that's that's all Ellis. That's on him. Mm. Yeah. And so so that guy, Nunez Flunky, as he is bad at his job and proud of it, idiot, was, of course, promoted to general counsel at the NSA as soon as Trump lost the election in order to embed him within the federal civil service. Something else you might recognize him from, and correct me if I'm wrong here, wasn't he the fella, the lawyer on the National Security Council, that hid all of the transcripts of the calls between the former guy and other leaders in that code word security system that we were talking about in the first impeachment indeed he was mm. uh it 
yeah, his his resume is a, a rather impressive uh, list of, uh, you know, what's what of what not to do. Yeah, yeah. And and so Trump put him in the NSA. NSA revolted, right? Former NSA yep. director Michael Hayden described Ellis as a really, really bad person and not good at all, unquote. <laughs> uh, not the kind of language you typically hear from civil servants. And uh, Ellis stayed in limbo, right? On January 16th, Acting Defense Secretary Chris Miller ordered the NSA to install Ellis by 6 p.m. <laughs> and they again refused. And when Biden assumed office, Nakasone accepted Ellis's appointment, but it immediately put him on administrative leave pending the inspector general inquiry into the circumstances of his appointment, knowing that it wouldn't go well. Ellis resigned last Friday. Now, this isn't the guy who we just mentioned, the mystery DOJ yeah, no. <laughs> character, because that that is the Department of Justice Inspector General. NSA over here would be what? The Pentagon Inspector General, right? Yep. Yep. Exactly yeah, right. So. Yeah. So a uh, separate, separate IG inquiry, separate guy quitting in the middle oh, wait, of it before. Wait, 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 wait. Unless the DOJ Inspector General was doing an investigation into the code word classified system that all of those things were stashed in. Mm, I still don't think so, right? Based on the timing. I, 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 don't, I don't think these, these mesh. Uh, but it's worth looking at, but I think that uh, I, I think the timing is off. I feel when, did, when do you think this mystery DOJ person well, it was a DOJ person, so it wouldn't have been him. Yeah, yeah no, exactly. Yeah. DOJ so, official. Nope. Doesn't matter. Just wanted to make that clear. Yep. Anyhow, yeah, Ellis. <laughs> Goodbye to you. But but there's still a little bit more, isn't there? That's <laughs> right. Wait, there's more. <laughs> Both Ellis and our friend Top Nunes Flunky, Kosh Patel. Oh, God, who that guy. <laughs> very familiar to Daily Beans and OA listeners and under investigation for leaking classified information because that's what they do. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know specifically what the probes are looking into. But Marcy Wheeler is covering that story over at her blog, EmptyWheel.net. Be sure to check that out, because apparently uh, Alice and Patel are both being investigated, or were, both <laughs> one is, one isn't. Uh, maybe now they're still being investigated by the actual, not the, not the Inspector General, but Department of Justice for leaking information, yep. classified information. Yep. That's what that's what Marcy says. So we're going to try and get her uh, to come on the show. And uh, she is fantastic. So we'll uh, hopefully get to the bottom of this. But uh, but in the meantime, uh, goodbye to you. Bye bye. <laughs> it's just so nice to say. Oh, God. And there you and there you have it. That's that's our show for today for Earth Day. And um, uh, as always, I've uh, I always enjoy doing these with you and uh, can't wait till we get to come back next week. Yes, we will see you all next week. This is AG signing off. And Andrew Torres. Bye bye. Clean Up on Aisle 45 is written and produced by Allison Gill and Andrew Torres and is engineered and edited by Mackenzie Mazzell and Starburns Audio. Fact checking and research by Allison Gill and Andrew Torres with quality assurance and media by Muller She Wrote LLC. Branding design and logo by Starburns Audio and Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios. And our copy is written by Jesse Egan. Our music is written and recorded by Adam Orr and Christopher Hoffey and our opening sequence is designed by Allison Gill and mixed by Mackenzie Mazzell and Starburns Audio. Follow us on Twitter at Aisle 45 Pod and listen wherever you get your podcasts. Season four of How We Win is here. For the past four years, we've been making history in critical elections all over the country. And last year, we made history again by expanding our majority in the Senate, beating election-denying Republicans in crucial state house races, and fighting back a non-existent red wave. But the MAGA Republicans who plotted and pardoned the attempted overthrow of our government now control the House thanks to gerrymandered maps and repressive anti-voter laws. And the chaotic spectacle we've already seen shows us just how far they will go to seize power, dismantle our government, and take away our freedoms. So the official podcast of The Persistence is back with season four. There's so much more important work ahead of us to fight for equity, justice, and our very democracy itself. We'll take you behind the lines and inside the rooms where it happens with strategy and inspiration from progressive changemakers all over the country. And we'll dig deep into the weekly news that matters most and what you can do about it with messaging and communications expert, co-founder of Way to Win, 
and our new co-host, Jennifer Fernandez Ancona. So join Steve and I every Wednesday for your weekly dose of inspiration, action, and hope. I'm Steve Pearson. And I'm Jennifer Fernandez Ancona. And And this this is is How We Win. Win.